Hey, good morning, church. It is good to see you guys this morning. If you are here for the first time visiting with us, man, we are so, so glad that you're here. And our hope is that you just feel loved and welcomed as you came in this morning. Uh, we've got a gift for you out at guest services. We'd love for you to pick up on your way out today, stop by, get to know us a little bit. Um, but man, we just want to say welcome to the family today. Um, if you did not grab one of these on your way in, make sure you do that now or grab one at the end of the service. There are a bunch of announcements on the back uh, that you want to pay attention to. One that's coming up that I want to draw your attention to is uh, child dedications happening on May 11 and 12, which is Mother's Day weekend. Uh, if you would like to have your child dedicated, that's the time to do it. You just need to sign up for that. Again, guest services can help you with that or just grab one of these and find all the information. Um, Church, are you ready to worship this morning? I hope so. Listen, um, let me start today. We are in this series on the Beatitudes, and man, I am so excited about this. It's such a great and powerful series that we're in. Um, and last week, we talked about the first one, which says, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And we talked about what it means to be broken and what it means to kind of be at the end of ourselves so that Jesus can step in and really bless us in ways that we couldn't uh, experience otherwise. This weekend, we're going to look at the second one. And it says, blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. So it's kind of a heavy week. Um, and I'm sure that there are people in this room who are going through mourning right now. And this morning, we're going to do some songs that really tie with what we're going to talk about. And it's kind of a throwback Sunday, actually. So uh, there's going to be people in the, there's going to be two groups of people in the room people that are going to sing with all their hearts today because these songs are ones that you've sang for years and years and years. Then there's others of you that are going to be like, I have never heard these songs before in my life. Um, but they're easy to sing. They're easy to catch on to. Would you stand with us as we sing about blessing the Lord regardless of our circumstances? We're going to sing about the fact that he never lets us go regardless of what we face. We're going to sing about the fact that there are 10,000 reasons to give him glory and honor and praise today, regardless of how we feel, regardless of the circumstances that we are in, that he is worthy of our praise. Do you believe that this morning, church? Do you believe that our God is higher than all other things, that he is higher than our circumstances, that he is higher than our situations, that he is higher than our mourning, and that he deserves all the praise that we can give him this morning? I hope so, and I hope that you will sing with us at the top of your lungs today as we bless the Lord. Blessed be your name in the land that is plentiful where your streams of abundance flow. Blessed be your name. Blessed be your name when found in the desert place. Though I walk through the wilderness, blessed be your name. Every blessing, every blessing you pour out, I'll turn back to praise. When the darkness closes in, Lord, still. Blessed be your name when the sun's shining down on me, when the world's all as it should be. Blessed be your name. Blessed be your name on the road marked with suffering. Though there's pain in the offering, blessed be your name. Blessing you pour out, out, turn back to praise. When the darkness closes in, Lord. 
Recognize that one? How about this? Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, your perfect love is casting out fear. Even when I'm caught in the middle of the storms of this life, I won't turn back, I know you are near And I will fear no evil For my God is with me And if my God is with me Whom then shall I fear? Whom then shall I
church sing
declaring that you alone are holy, that you alone are worthy. And God, we choose to bless your name regardless of our circumstances. God, you give and you take away. And Lord, in the midst of it all, you are still worthy. You deserve our praise, you deserve our worship and our adoration. So God, this morning we lift your name high declaring that there is none other like you. And we thank you, Jesus, that you are near to us in our suffering and in our mourning and in our difficulty. And that you don't leave us alone. You never let us go. And God, there will always be thousands of reasons to lift your name high, to worship you, to exalt you, to praise you. Help us to see those things even in the midst of of the struggle. Holy Spirit, come and speak to our hearts today. Challenge us through your word. Jesus, we love you. It's in your holy and matchless and precious name that we pray. And the church said, amen. Have a seat. Amen. Well, good morning. I'd like to give you a welcome into the room here this morning. For those of you in the uh, video venue, a uh, very, very special welcome. Those watching online, again, a very special welcome to Grand Point this morning. Uh, at this hour, the, the, the house is full, and uh, we, we had a, uh, a meeting yesterday from our Connections team led by Cressa, and we were able to acknowledge all the volunteers that help get people in here, and uh, there was some conversation about how we can all help each other. Maybe like, like if, you, if you get in here and there's an extra seat in your pew somewhere, just kind of move in, let it be visible. Uh, our team's doing the best job that they can to get everybody uh, in this room. But we're so grateful that we are able to scatter and just uh, uh, be at different places here this morning. So welcome. This is Volunteer Appreciation Weekend. And for every volunteer at Grand Point Church, I just want to say from the bottom of my heart, thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, you have made this church, you, you're the ones that make this work. Uh, those of us on staff could not do it if it were not for you. So uh, we just want to thank our volunteers. When you jump out into the lobby, you see anyone out there with a blue shirt on, most likely they're a volunteer. Uh, just thank them for helping you get around and uh, be a part of uh, the church. Well, I want to welcome you back. Uh, we're in a series right now called The Beatitudes. And as Chris uh, said in his opening, uh, we're on week number two of The Beatitudes. And I'd just like to share... Uh, share that one with you this morning. The Beatitudes are actually the preamble uh, to the greatest sermon that has ever been preached called the Sermon on the Mount. And it's a sermon that was given by Jesus. You can read all about it in Matthew chapter 5, 6, and 7. The reason that we decided to do this series is because uh, we want to be the people, those of us in leadership, uh, we want to be the people, and we want you to be the people who make a positive difference in your families, in your communities, in the great state of Pennsylvania, and in the global connections uh, that we have around the world. We want you to be able to make the difference. See, right after Jesus gave the Beatitudes, he said to his followers, you are the salt of the earth, and you are the light of the world. 
In other words, the Beatitudes are what make you the salt of the earth and the light of the world. Jesus said this, and when he said this, he's like, we're we're to be the people uh, who have the same character and the same purpose with which he came. And we're going to take on that very nature of Christ. And so following up on the Beatitudes, he said, you are going to be the salt of the earth and the light of the world. And right after he gave the Beatitudes, or the Beatitudes were to reorient our lives or our values to align with kingdom principles. And in order for us to make a difference, most of the time our values need to be reoriented. Right, Because we pick up values from the world. We pick up values from our, our flesh. We pick up values maybe from the business community. But, but in order to make a difference in the world for Christ's sake, we need to align our values uh, to the kingdom. So the kingdom mission is vitally related to kingdom character. Now, if that is true, then it's important to understand what these enigmatic beatitudes mean. Because when we read these at face value, they don't make sense. There's a little bit of mystery involved in these Beatitudes. So we're going to take a look at all eight Beatitudes, and we're in week number two uh, today. Now, I think it's important for us to understand that every Beatitude begins with this word blessed, and the Greek word for blessed is this word makarios. Typically, it's translated to be happy or to be blessed. But both of those definitions fall short of the real meaning and the depth of meaning of the word makarios. See, for us to be happy, we sometimes rely on relationships. Relationships are to make us happy. And so we even say, uh, they're not making me happy anymore, so I'm going to withdraw from them or I'm going to leave that relationship. If you're not happy with your job, most likely you're going to be applying somewhere else. If you're not happy with your church, you'll go to a church that makes you happy. So happiness for us, us is kind of this state of being, and it's what we experience. And then when we say blessed, if we're, if we're using this word uh, blessed, sometimes that in our minds is just, man, well, I've got, I've got some things going on, right? Uh, life is good to me. I have good health. I've been blessed with good health. I've been, I've been blessed with a great job. And, and all those things are true, but that form of blessing still misses the meaning of the word uh, makarios. So let me tell you what it means right here in this text. The word blessed that's used in the Beatitudes is a word that indicates the pathway to flourishing as a human being. Now, who doesn't want that? Right? We want to flourish. We, we want to have everything going for us. We want to be bearing the fruit of, of, of the Spirit in our lives. We want to just have that positive impact on the people and the world around us. So it means uh, it indicates the pathway to flourishing. So it means to experience the shalom, the fullness, the, the wholeness, and the completeness of satisfaction of life in God's kingdom. Now, for everyone in this room watching online today, watching in the video venue, uh, if you are, or if you're going through a season of life right now where you're wondering, how am I ever going to make life work? Maybe you're in a season right now where you're like, I don't know how to experience God's blessing. I don't know if I'll ever experience this peace that we talk about that comes from the gospel. Maybe you're there, and if you are, the Beatitudes are for you. It's found right here in the Beatitudes. Maybe you want to be salt and light in the world around us, and uh, uh, the, the, the Beatitudes are the foundation uh, for that as well. Uh, if you want to be fulfilled, we need to start right here. Now, as we do, As we do, as we go to these Beatitudes, we're discovering in this series that the blessed life is found in some of the most unlikely places. See, we read that Jesus says, blessed are you if, or blessed are you when, and we're like, we're like, really? You have got to be kidding me, because we read things like broken and mourning, hunger and thirst and persecution, and those things rarely make our bucket list. And yet God says, these, uh, Jesus says, these are God's priority for his children for the all-important reasons that they reflect his nature and they embody his purposes. Now stay with me for a while because I really want you to understand what this means for, to, for the morning to be comforted. See, if you want to fit in to get the kingdom of God without looking like a tourist, these are the things that you've got to wear. And if you want to, make, if you want to be salt and light in the world around you, this is where you get your flavor. This is where you get your shine. It's all right here in these eight Beatitudes. 
Now, let me just do a little review. Uh, we'll go back to last week where we said uh, the statement that, we, that Jesus gave last week was, blessed are the poor in spirit, uh, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Jesus simply wants his disciples to know that being broken or bankrupt in spirit is not a bad thing. In fact, that's often the beginning of our progress. That's where blessing can actually happen. When you and I come to God and we say, we have nothing to bring, nothing to offer, we just want you. We want your life in us. That's when the blessed life really begins. But now we jump into the second beatitude, and our statement for today is found in Matthew chapter 5, verse 4. Blessed, listen, this is not going to make sense. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. This one needs some explanation, doesn't it? It almost sounds like Jesus is saying, hey, just be happy if you're having a bad day. That doesn't fit with our understanding. So as I unpack this beatitude, I realize that there's going to be a lot of serious uh, conversation that we're going to have today, and, and that's good. Uh, what we're going to talk about is going to hit probably every single one of us somewhere, and it kind of leaves us maybe just thinking. So let me begin with a story that is not so serious. Are you okay with that? All right, we love to laugh here a little bit, all right? So let me tell you a story about this guy. He, uh, he loved motorcycles, and so he was fixing his motorcycle on the back deck of his, his house, and he's cleaning it, and he's... Uh, you know, tuning this thing up. And after he has all that done, he sits on the bike, starts it and revs the engine. Uh, he accidentally kicked the thing into gear and the motorcycle lunges forward right through the double glass patio doors into the living room where he lays the bike over. Now his wife hears the crash. She comes running into the living room and she sees her husband laying there all, all cut with, you know, this glass. And, and so she calls the paramedics they come out and they treat his superficial cuts and his wounds, but they decide to take him to the hospital for observation. While he's at the hospital, the wife decides to clean up the mess. So she picks up the bike, takes it outside, cleans up the glass, and then discovers that when he laid the bike over, all the gasoline ran out into the carpet of the living room. So she gets out the paper towels, Bounty, of course, and uh, she begins to soak up the gasoline, and she has these gas-soaked towels, and so she takes them and throws them into the toilet, right? Meanwhile, her husband is treated and released at the hospital, right? He comes home. He's still shaken from all this. He's still worked up, so he decides to go into the bathroom, sit down in the toilet, and smoke a cigarette just to kind of relax a little. Some of you are way ahead of me here. Come on. So he's smoking a cigarette. He's halfway through, and he flips the rest of it into the toilet. Right, his wife hears the explosion. She comes running into the bathroom. She finds her husband laying there. His pants are blown off, right? He has burns on places that I can't even mention to you today. So she calls the paramedics. The same paramedics come. This time they pick him up. They put him on a stretcher. And halfway down the stairs, one of the paramedics asks, what happened? The man's telling the story. <laughs> the paramedics began to laugh so bad, so hard, that one of them drops his end of the, of the stretcher. The man falls off and breaks his arm. <laughs> end of story. Now, you can decide what value or appropriateness that is to the human experience, right? The reality is all of us have bad days, don't we? We all have bad days sometimes. We have things that come into our lives that cause pain. We have things that, that just destroy our dreams. We have things that cause grief and mourning. We have hard stuff that comes. And I'll tell you, I'll, I'll be honest with you. As I was working through this series on the Beatitudes, I found it to be more theologically challenging than I anticipated it would be, especially uh, this particular Beatitude. So it's so like I'm reading this, and I'm like, what, what is that exactly does, does he mean by this? Is Jesus talking about mourning over our circumstances, like in my story? Or is he talking about a real deep grief and mourning over the sin that reaps havoc in our lives? Furthermore, is the comfort something that's only for the future, like out there in Revelation chapter 21, where in that new city there's not going to be any more crying or tears or dying or suffering? Or is there some way that we can receive the comfort right now? And so as I studied this, my, my conclusion is it's both. The answer to, the answer to both these questions is, is yes. Yes, I, I think it is for our circumstances. It is grief and it is mourning over our sin. Yes, there's comfort for the future, but there's also comfort for the present. See, I, the context for the Sermon on the Mount is on this hillside, Outside the Sea of Galilee, just near the Sea of Galilee, where a huge crowd of people are gathering to hear Jesus. 
And, and the, the word for crowd really means a large group of unidentified people. Now, for the disciples, for us, when we're in a group, when we're in a large group, we don't all know each other's names. So this morning, we're kind of like a group of unidentified people. So I've been in ministry now, been, been preaching for like almost 27 years. And I realize that every time I stand before a congregation, I, I know some of you by name. I know some of your circumstances, but, but I don't know everyone. So every time I stand before a, a group and speak and look at you and, you know, I, I can't see those of you in the video venue or online, but I can just picture, you know, everyone that's out there, not purposefully, but when I speak, my eyes fall on people who I know are going home to an empty house because their spouse passed away. Cooking lunch for one. Spending the afternoon alone, the whole evening, maybe by yourself. And there's some pain, there's some mourning with that. Uh, my eyes also fall on people who I know are going home to empty houses, not because your spouse passed away, but because they left for another person. And there's, there's an additional pain that's even involved in that. As, as I stand and speak almost every week, my eyes fall on a young couple who I know so desperately want to be parents, but they can't conceive. My eyes fall on people who can conceive, but they've had a miscarriage. There's a disappointment. There's, there's the loss of a child maybe at birth or maybe the loss of a child even a couple years into their lives. I know the grief. I know the mourning that's there. As I look out here, I see some people that are going through, coming out of rehab for the second or third time. And listen, these are only a few of the instances that I know. But I want you to know that Jesus knows them all. Jesus knows everything. See, to gather people is to gather sad stories. Everybody that's gathered here has come in with something in their lives that's broken, an unmet expectation, a broken, shattered dream, something that just just didn't work the way they anticipated it would. And so I wonder, like when Jesus is out there on the hillside above the Sea of Galilee, given these Beatitudes, I, I wonder if he's also scanning the crowd out there and, and sees these countless sad narratives, right? People standing shoulder to shoulder with broken dreams, lost opportunities, painful experiences. And we don't know what Jesus is thinking, but we're taken back by what he says. He says, blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. So what exactly does he mean by this? I guess a nice place to start would be figuring out what Jesus is thinking about when he uses this word mourning, to mourn. The, the Greek word for mourn that's used here is the, the strongest word for mourning in the Greek language, the entire Greek language. And it's defined as the kind of grief which takes such a hold that it cannot be hidden. It, it's not only the sorrow that brings a little ache to the heart, but it's sorrow that brings unrestrainable tears to your eyes. So, so this is not like all you Steelers fans mourning the loss of Kenny Pickett to the Eagles, right? This is not you uh, just upset by the fact that you weren't invited to the party. This isn't just a sadness that your favorite houseplant just died. No, this is an all-consuming grief that is real and it's natural. And it's, it's an experience of something that breaks your heart. Now, let me suggest uh, two areas where this kind of mourning would be very appropriate or very common for the follower of Christ. And I just need to begin with this. Number one is there's a mourning that should occur in response to the sin in ourselves and in the world. Uh, listen, I don't know if you watch the news and are just kind of wrecked by it. Like if it breaks your heart or you see the stuff that's happening or the, the sin that's wreaking havoc in your life or in the life of one of your family members or one of your friends, does it break your heart to, to the place that you grieve and you mourn the fact that there's sin that is so prominent in the world around us? See, this kind of mourning is triggered by the devastation of sin that wreaks havoc on, on us, on those that we love and in the world around us. All throughout scripture, there's this connection between mourning over sin of every kind and receiving God's blessing. See, the nation of Israel together, they mourned, uh, they mourned uh, sin as a nation, 
but they also receive God's blessing as a nation. Maybe on a more individual basis, a great story would be the story of David. Uh, some of you know David. You know the story. He had an affair uh, with Bathsheba, and he tried to hide it. Right? He tried to cover it because he didn't want to lose his reputation. He didn't want to lose his job as the general, as the king. Right? So he tried to hide the sin. But over time, over time, the magnitude of, the, of his sin came, came, came crushing down on him, and he was utterly distressed. He was distraught. In fact, man, he was, he was undone, and he mourned from the very depths of his soul. On the surface, it may have looked like David had it all together, like he was doing okay. He got up every morning, went to work, did his thing, put on a positive face, uh, but uh, played with his kids. But at the soul level, it was a totally different story. He was missing out on this life-changing, faith-altering blessing from God. Can I just say the same thing is true for you? If, you? if you attempt to cover a sin in your life, it will eat you up. You might think right now that it doesn't have any negative impact on you. You know it's a sin, but you're practicing. Nobody else knows it, so it's easy for you to do. And you're in it day after day, or maybe it's something that happened in the past but has never been revealed, never been forgiven. You're covering it. You're covering it. Pretty soon, you're going to, be, you're going to come crashing down. And it, it's amazing to me. Well, let me just read David's uh, story. David says in Psalm 32, verses 1 and 2, I mean, he's grieving this sin that, that's in his life right now. Here's what he came to realize. He came to realize that blessed is the one whose transgressions are what? Forgiven. Blessed are those who trans, whose transgressions are forgiven, not hidden, not covered up, whose sins are covered not by yourself but by God. Blessed is the one whose sin the Lord does not count against them and in whose spirit there is no deceit. I'm amazed at how many people openly admit to living in sin, but they do not grieve it. They do not mourn it at all. In fact, they deny that it's having any negative impact on their lives. Denial is always the path of least resistance, but you don't want to go where that path leads because it does not lead to blessing. So David says in verse 32, verse 3, when I kept silent, when I covered this, Right? I didn't reveal this. I didn't confess it. I don't want anyone to know about this. When I kept silent, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. This is impacting him physically. For day and night, your hand was heavy on me. My strength was, was sapped as in the heat of summer. This is a little bit of my story, and I know I've shared some of this with you before. I was blessed to have been uh, raised in a Christian home. I had the benefit of Christian schools all my uh, early education, high school. But after high school, there were about eight years of my life when I just I took a detour from all that I had been taught from, uh, from my relationship with Christ. And I kind of wanted to experience what was out there in the world. And, and I did. And I did some stuff that I had to cover. And you know what you do when you have to cover your sins? You got to tell a bunch of lies. That's how you do it. And I did. I told lie after lie after lie because a lot of stuff that I did had to be covered. So it was kind of toward the end of that eight-year period, just, just living with covering my sins, covering your tracks, which is what you have to do, that I met Penny. And uh, Penny was a different kind of a person and a girl than I had ever met before. And there was something about her that I loved and I liked, but she also saw something that was lacking in me. And she very lovingly told me that I cannot have a relationship with you because of where you're at in your spiritual life. So she called it off and we did not date. So it was in that time though, I did some soul search and I did some evaluation of my life. And I don't know why and I don't know how, but I picked up my Bible and I came to this Psalm 32. This was a life changer for me. And I'm reading this and I'm reading verse three. It says, when I kept silent, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long, and I remember exactly where I was sitting. I remember having my Bible open to this, and I remember thinking, I don't want to be that. I don't want to be that person that is bogged down with this guilt that has this heaviness on me. Because even, even the last part of the verse is like, like my strength was sapped as in the heat of summer. 
Listen, to carry guilt, to carry hidden sin is the greatest burden that you will ever carry. It is a weight on you that you don't realize and you're going to try to work through it. You're going to try to hide it. You're going to pretend it's not there, but you have no idea how much it's weighing you down. It is, it is, it is putting pressure on you. Listen, it's affecting you physically. You, you know how you feel when you're sapped with the heat of summer, man, you're tired, you're exhausted. That's what happens when you carry sin, unconfessed sin around in you. And I'm thinking, listen, I don't want to be that. So I read this next verse, verse five, David says, then I acknowledge, because there's an answer to this. David says, then I acknowledge my sin to you and I did not cover up my iniquity any longer. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord and you forgave me the guilt of my sin. And in the midst of tears, I said, that's what I'm going to do. That's what I'm going to do. And I did it. I had, I had those hard conversations. I had to track down those people that I lied to, that, that, that I was hiding things from. And I took care of it. I confessed it. And, and listen, the greatest part of this verse, the greatest thing that you will ever hear and realize is, and you, Lord, you forgave the guilt of my sin. And for the first time in at least eight years, I knew the blessing. What a relief. What, what, a, what, a, what a load lifted, right? And God used, that, God used that moment to change my life, to bring me back to him, and even, even that moment to prepare me for what he had in my future. Blessed is the one whose sins are forgiven. When you know the blessing, you will mourn the sin. See, the reason many of us don't mourn over our sin, the reason that sin does not grieve us and break us down is because you don't know the blessing. You may have never experienced the blessing. When you know the blessing, you'll mourn over the sin. So this mourning in response to sin in and around us comes from within. This was something that God did within me. It's something that God did within David. It's, God, it's something that God will do within you. But there's a second kind of mourning that comes as a result of things that happen outside of us as a result of our circumstances. Now, these circumstances might be described in what one writer calls uh, six-word sagas. L listen to some of them. There has been a terrible accident. The six words tell a whole story, don't they? They could tell the story of a lot of life change. I'm leaving. The marriage is over. Your position is no longer needed. I just want to be friends. The cancer isn't responding to treatment. We're not able to conceive. Or here's a rose from the casket. All of these tell a story, don't they? A story that's accompanied by mourning, by grief, by a lot of pain. And you ask the question, where's the blessing in this? Where is the blessing in this? If the Beatitudes are describing how we would view blessings from a cultural perspective, we would read something like, blessed are you when everything goes your way. Blessed are you when all of your dreams come true. Blessed are you, right, if this and that. We know what blessing is. See, a blessed life, as any normal person would describe it, would be a life free from mourning, not a life that's marked by it. So, so let me give you kind of a little playbook uh, here this morning of how to turn your, your mourning into comfort, how to turn your grief perhaps into, into joy. I, I'm not going to pretend this is just a simple one, two, three, check these off and you automatically got it, but, but it's a list that I simply want you to try. So, so you may not think that anything's going to change your circumstances right now. You're in the midst of some deep pain, deep mourning, deep grief, I fully understand that, and I'm not minimizing that in any way, but three things I want you to try. But before I give you those three things, let me read you the scripture from where they come from. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 3. You're going to love this. Praise be to the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of compassion and the God of all, say it with me, comfort, who comforts us in all of our troubles. Now, time out right here. I, I need you to hear this. I need you to hear this. I may not have the moral authority to speak to your situation, 
And I may have never experienced what you are experiencing and what you're going through. I'm not pretending to. But can I just say that Paul, the writer of this scripture, knows. He knows. Man, this brother had it rough. You go ahead and read 2 Corinthians chapter 11 and just be glad that that wasn't your bad day. It was bad. Here is Paul having experienced some of the worst human suffering, and he comes along and he says, I'm telling you, he, he can comfort you. He can bring comfort. Why? So that we can comfort those in any trouble with the comfort we ourselves have received from God. That's God's plan. That is God's hope for us. Not that we can like live perfect lives and be better than all the other people around us, but the hope is that we can go through all things, all things, and they will, will not, and, but, and they'll impact us in a different way than they do the rest of the world. See, see, we don't grieve as those who have no hope, right? So, so Paul said, listen, because of God and the hope that we have in him, listen, he is the God that can bring comfort. We have the comfort of God on our side, and now we can comfort others with the same comfort uh, that we have received from him. Verse five, for just as we share abundantly in the sufferings of Christ, so also comfort abounds through Christ. Notice the language of abundance. If there's an abundance of suffering, there's an abundance of comfort that comes from Christ. Now, verse eight says, we do not want you to be uninformed, brothers and sisters, about the troubles we experienced in the province of Asia. We were under great pressure, far beyond our ability to endure, so that we despaired of life itself. You can't go lower than that, can you? Where you're even wondering, is life even worth living? So I had a guy come into my office on Thursday and he's sitting there, he's going through something uh, real, uh, real tough right now. And he actually told me earlier this week, he had a loaded gun to his head. He was at that place, despairing of life itself. That is about the lowest place that you can go. That's where Paul was. We despaired of life itself. Verse nine, indeed we felt that we had received the sentence of death. Now I want you to look at this next verse. This is a life changer right here. This will help you understand it all. Verse nine, Paul says, but this happened. All of this horrible stuff, this suffering, this pain, this, this stuff that even took us to, the, to, to wondering if life is even worth living at all. All of this happened, he says, so that we might not rely on ourselves, but on God who raises the dead. We just came through the season of, of, of Easter. Please do not pack up the resurrection power until next Easter Sunday. Live it. The same power that raised Jesus from the dead is the same power that enables you to go through whatever it is that God is putting in your path right now. Even if it's suffering, even if it's death, the same power that raised Jesus from the dead is available for you. He has, verse 10, he has delivered us from such a deadly peril, and he will deliver us again. On him we have set our hope that he will continue to deliver us as you help us by your prayers. Then many will give thanks on our behalf for the gracious favor granted us in answer to the prayers of many. It always goes back to how our bad days will impact other people. So here are the three, three things that I want you to write down, and next time you're having a bad day, I want you to put these things into practice. Number one, refocus on what's happening in me, not to me. Refocus on what's happening in me, not to me. See, when hard times come at you, you need to take a deep breath and think, if something is happening to me, God is wanting to do something in me. If something is happening to me, God is wanting to do something in me. See, Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 9, this happened, all this stuff happened that we might not rely on who? Ourselves, but on God who raises the dead. So here's the question. What is God working in you as a result of your pain? What is God working in us as a result of our mourning? And if you don't ask God to show you, you're simply going to you'll simply delay the answer. Because he has an answer to your question. Because God will never never waste your pain. 
Chris Hodges says it this way. He says, my pain is either a jail that imprisons me or it's a school that shapes me. And it's our choice. It's our choice. Dick and Elizabeth Peterson were, were a happily married couple. And they, life was going really, really well for them. And then one day, uh, Elizabeth was diagnosed with multiple sclerosis. And Dick knew this would be a life changer for them. He knew that the path forward would be difficult. But what he didn't realize was that just how much he would come to know more of Jesus through it all. So Dick and Elizabeth Peterson, they, um, they accepted this new journey. And as this disease, this uh, you know, intruder invaded his wife's body, it's almost as if it invaded his as well. He watched her move from a cane to a walker and then from a walker to a wheelchair. Uh, every setback that she endured was also his setback or together it was their setback. His life was dramatically impacted by her increasing needs and together they realized that they were utterly out of control as their lives just spiraled more and more into devastation. There was only one path and the path forward for them was, was set by this disease. And, and the path forward grew narrower and narrower every single day that they lived it. They prayed for healing with every ounce of faith that they had. Their friends prayed for them. Their neighbors prayed for them. Their family prayed for them. Their church prayed for them. They heard about miracles and they wondered if God had one for them. And if he didn't, why not? And then one day, uh, as they were asking these questions, they realized that the questions themselves were a form of suffering, but there was something else that they had to admit, a possibility that they had never considered before. And this possibility was maybe something was being done to, wasn't just being done to them, but maybe something was being done for them. One day, Elizabeth stopped and she asked her husband, she said, did it really take this to teach me that my soul is more important to God than my body is? And then Dick looked at her and he says, yeah, was this the cost of teaching me compassion? Uh, together they prayed for Elizabeth to get her old life back, but it occurred to them that maybe God cared more about her experience in a new life. Not the old life, not the way it was, but a new life, a deeper one, a wiser one. See, they were praying for change on the outside, but God cared more about change on the inside. They realized that they were praying for their desires, but God answered by meeting their needs. How do, how do we pray? Like, what do we do? Look at our prayer list. What if, what if we're praying that God would take away something that he's planning to use to make us better? What if we're praying, uh, like, like we, we're praying for the outside stuff, right? I don't think it's wrong to pray for healing. But, but listen, maybe, that's, maybe God's wanting to use the disease, the hardship, the death, to, to grow you on the inside, to make you something that you were better than you were before? What if, what if we're praying for God to take away the very things that he wants to use to grow us? Just, just a way to think about this. Next time you're going through a hard time, just refocus perhaps on what's happening in me and not just what's happening to me. Now, now, I know that when we're going through the circumstances, it's all about, yeah, what's happening to us, and we, we, we feel all that pain. We, we even go through moments of self-pity, and oh, if, it, if only it would be different. But, but, but look at what God's doing in you. Number two in the playbook is this. When you're having a bad day, remember that God will come through. He always does. He always does. Look at verse 10. He has delivered us from such a deadly peril, he will deliver us again. On him we have set our hope that he will continue to deliver us. Notice the words. He has. He will. He will continue to. Say that with me. He has. He will. He will continue to. Every voice in this place, every voice online, every voice on the video venue, say it. He has. He will. And he will continue to. 
The greatest indicator of God helping you in your future is looking at his faithfulness in the past. He has. He has been faithful. He will be faithful. He will continue to. Never, never forget that. Remember, God will come through. He always does. The third point in the playbook is this. Rely on solid life-giving relationships. Now, when you're having a bad day and you're going through a season of mourning, listen, I perfectly understand the need for you to have space. You need to be away from people, away from circumstances. There's moments when you just need that privacy. But don't stay there. Don't stay there because God has provided other people for your healing. Look what it says in verse 11. He will continue to deliver us as you help us by your prayers. Who's the us? The us is the Corinthian church. It's the Corinthian church. See, God designed and God provided the church as the means of your journey from mourning to comfort. He says, then many will give thanks on our behalf for the gracious favor God granted us in answer to the prayers of many. We all need people who are going to pray for us. We do. And with us through our mourning. Here at Grand Point, we, we would love for everyone to be in a small group. 10 to 12 people that you share life together. And we realize that we're not there yet. We don't have every single person in a small group. Many of you are, and you realize the benefit of that. But when we gather like this in a crowd like this, we're basically a group of unidentified people. We don't all know each other's names. I don't even know all of your names. We don't know each other's families. We don't know each other's circumstances. But when you're in a small group of 10 to 12 people, you know everyone's name, right? You know their families. You know where they work. You know their stories. You know what, where they're hurting. And you can pray together. Listen, people in small groups need you to pray for them. And one day, you're going to need them to pray for you. I would encourage you just to, to, to do whatever you can to, to, to try to find that, that group, circle, right? So that you can be a part of that and have people pray for you. That's what God did. That's just his provision. He designed the church to be that source to take you from mourning to comfort. And it happens when people pray and when, people, when you can pray for people. So if you want to get through your bad day, you want to get through this mourning, this grief, refocus. Don't just look at what's happening to you, but see what God is doing in you. And remember, remember also he's been faithful in the past. He will come through again. And then by all means, do not try to go through it alone. You and I were never, never meant to live life on our own. No, we were meant to be part of a community, a part of a body of Christ. And remember, he's the God of all comfort. I don't know, again, like what you're going through right now. Again, I don't know all of your names, and I don't know all of your circumstances. But, but God does. And maybe today you're not in a small group, and you don't have that privilege yet to share uh, that with them. So we're a large group today, but that doesn't mean that we will not pray for you. I, I want to remind you that outside these doors, the first room on the left, there's a prayer room. Whenever uh, you, we dismiss here, you would like someone to pray for you and with you. Stop by that room. It's private. They'll go in there. They'll pray with you. But I also want to invite you as we sing our last hymn today, if you want someone to pray over you, to pray God's comfort over you today, I will do that. You just come and you just kneel here at the altar. And if there's more people than I can handle, somebody else just jump up and come and pray uh, God's comfort over them, right? That's what we do. It's, that's what the body of Christ is for. That's the church at work. That's God providing for your comfort. Remember, he's the God of all comfort, and he will provide that comfort for you. Would you stand with me as we pray together? God, as we stand in your presence this morning, we know that you are the, the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of all compassion and the God of all comfort. We stand before you today, God, we recognize our need for it because many of us are going through a season of mourning. We're going through a season of grief and we're wondering if life will ever be different for us. 
God, maybe today would be that turning point where we would just receive your comfort like never, never before as God's people pray together. Maybe there's someone in this room, someone watching online, someone in the video venue today, and you're like, man, I just, I've, I've just never been broken over my sin. I'm still walking around with a whole bunch of covered up sins in my life. No wonder I'm tired. No wonder I'm stressed out. No wonder life isn't a, a life of freedom for me. And maybe you're like I was. You got to that place where you're like, I do not want this anymore. And you mourn and grieve over that sin to the point that you want to confess. Listen, we, could, we, wanted, uh, we want to just have you, God, God, I just pray that you would prompt those in this room today to come and confess. Those in the video venue, just to find someone there to confess uh, the sins before, uh, before you. God, I pray that this would be a morning where comfort would overwhelm God's people in this place today. Lord, we love you and thank you for your great provisions for us. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's sing together. If God's prompting you to come for prayer, uh, please come. I would be delighted. Uh, to pray with you.
God, may that be our prayer, is that you bring us to a place where we want nothing else other than you. That you would be enough for us. God, help us to recognize our sin. Help us to mourn over that sin. God, help us to recognize the fact that you are with us in the midst of our mourning over our circumstances. Help us to be willing to reach out for help to the church and those around us. God, may we live a life that is full of the blessing that you speak about. In Jesus' name, amen. Guys, thank you so much for being here this morning. Just a reminder, part of our worship is giving. And if you would like to do that, there's boxes in the back to do that. You can do that online as well. But man, go and live the blessed life this week, and we'll see you next week.